Hey, it's KJ with Living Christian, and welcome to the Bible Reading and Coffee Drinking Podcast. If this is your first time here, what we do on this podcast is read a chapter of the Bible, drink a little bit of coffee, and talk a whole lot about Jesus along the way. Each episode dives into Scripture and discusses it in a somewhat modern and relatable way. I'll also be answering some questions from my social media followers. They'll submit a question if you'd like me to answer it. Oh, and we'll drink coffee along the way as well. Although our main focus is reading the Bible and drinking some coffee, we will also occasionally be doing some interviews, some random other messages along the way, so be sure to check back often. If you feel the urge to support the podcast, you can do so right here on the podcast page. If this podcast helps you grow in your faith, maybe consider sending it to a friend or uh, maybe dropping a rating or review. It certainly helps us get the word out. And also make sure you check out livingchristian.org for Bible verse lists, Christian blog, an apparel store with a bunch of Christian t-shirts, hoodies, hats, and more. It's awesome. All livingchristian.org. And if you're there, make sure you use the code podcast20. That's a special code for 20% off our entire store only for our podcast listeners. So podcast20, use that when you're on livingchristian.org. Now let's get to the episode. All right. Good morning, everybody. Uh, For those just joining us, we are about to hit uh, Genesis 6 and 7. Um, and we're going to talk about the story of Noah and his son. So it's going. So if you missed the last episode, we did Genesis two and three. So we're skipping four and five. We're just talking about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. I'm just kind of kind of moving my way through Genesis a little bit. So I wanted to talk about uh, six and seven. We're in the next couple of episodes. We're going to really hit the flood and Noah and all those things. So we're going to talk about all that. So this starts that conversation and that reading with Genesis six and seven. So in case, just as a reminder, if you missed this episode, if you missed any of the episodes previously, you can check it out on YouTube or on Instagram uh, or on uh, my podcast. But go to livingchristian.org. We have a couple things going on right now on uh, the website. One is our Christmas sale. So it is November the 7th. as the time I'm recording this and doing this live on Instagram. Uh, and we do a Christmas sale every year. So for the next probably month, probably five weeks until I can kind of do a cutoff date for uh, presents, it'll be 20% off the entire store. Use the code Jolly20, and you'll get 20%. All the details there on livingchristian.org. Also, check out my children's book, Bear Goes Home for Christmas. So I've posted about this before. Uh, so check it out. So if you have kids or grandkids, um, and if you're listening to this on the podcast, you can't see, but I just showed the book. Uh, but it's illustrated. It's beautiful. And uh, I wrote it uh, this summer and produced it, and it came out just a short while ago. So if you have kids or grandkids, it's perfect for that. Uh, it's on sale on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. But once again livingchristian.org uh, has a link to where you can purchase that. I appreciate that. So that's my first children's book. So it's kind of exciting. Uh, so far, it's going pretty well. But I, I love doing it, and I get a lot of it. And it's about my dog, Bear, when he was a puppy uh, and how he got uh, brought home during Christmas. So it's uh, kind of a special uh, story for me. All right, let's hit Genesis, uh, what were we, 6 and 7? All right, so a world gone wrong. Then the people began to multiply on earth. So this is, as I mentioned, this is after Adam and Eve. They've had all their, their children. Cain and Abel came, and then it kind of went through in, in, in um, Genesis 5, the lineage of Adam. So it kind of gets us where we're at. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and the daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So a couple of things to take in with this, okay? One is there's a little bit of um, the sons of God comment. Uh, on one hand, uh, some people think it's talking about the faithful people of the time, the people that are dedicated to, to God. The other hand, it could be angels. That's why they, they took the, the beautiful women as their wives, and we'll get to why in a minute. So there's a lot of uh, conversation on whether those were angels that actually came down to earth and uh, had wives, uh, which is interesting. Um, but um, the two things I really want to hit on this very first part is one is it didn't take long for God to get tired of our antics. Uh, he's talking about my spirit will not put up with any humans any long any longer, for they are only mortal flesh. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. So God's already tired of our antics down here on earth. We had the fall in the garden. We're sinning. We're we got possibly angels taking, you know, uh, human wives. It's a, it's a mess down here. So in, in turn, he, he kind of limited our lives to no more than 120 years. And you got to think, when you go back, some of these people were like Seth was 912 years old. Adam was 930 years old. They lived a lot longer back then. And everything's going to change with the flood. All right? 
Uh, verse 4, in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites, so the Nephilim, this is what we're talking about, possibly being the offspring of the angels and, uh, and the, the humans, uh, the giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For, whatever, for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he gave that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he had ever made them and put them on earth. It broke his heart, which is a powerful statement that it's written here. We broke God's heart because of the way we, have, we were living at the time. And the Lord said, I will wipe out this human race I have created from the face of the earth. Yes, I will destroy every living thing, all the people, the large animals, the small animals that scurry along the ground, and even the birds of the sky. I am sorry I have ever made them, but Noah found favor with the Lord. Okay. This is kind of where we're going. That God is just fed up with us as a human race, uh, and we're obviously not living right. And he, He's ready to wipe out the earth, and whether He's going to start over, who knows? But He found favor with Noah. Noah was um, the one that kind of saved our human race. Verse nine. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, the only blameless person living on earth at the time and he walked in close fellowship with God. Noah was the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. All right, so he, he is the only blameless person. So he's the only one that found favor with God, okay? Verse 11, Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. God observed all this corruption in the world, for everyone on earth was corrupt. So God said to Noah, I have decided to destroy all living creatures, for they have filled the earth with violence. Yes, I will wipe them out along with the earth. Build a large boat from cypress wood and waterproof it with tar inside and out. Then construct decks and stalls throughout its interior. Make the boat 450 feet long. This is translated, right? Uh, 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Leave an 18-inch opening below the roof all the way around the boat. Put the door on the side and build three decks inside the boat, lower, middle, and upper. So he's giving instructions to Noah of how to build the ark, okay? Let me have a sip of coffee. So Noah being the blameless man, the only one that found favor with God, he gives instructions on how to survive what is coming. All right, verse 17. Look, I'm about to cover the earth with a flood that will destroy every living thing that breathes. Everything on earth will die, but I will confirm my covenant with you. So enter the boat, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. Bring a pair of every kind of animal, a male and a female, into the boat with you to keep them alive during the flood. Pairs of every kind of bird and every kind of animal and every kind of small animal that scurries along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And be sure to take on board enough food for your family and all of the animals. Verse 22, so Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. So a couple things here, okay? Um, one is uh, the, the flood. And, and the story of Noah, okay, is a, is a precursor to the revelation of Jesus Christ, okay? There's a lot of stories in the Old Testament that are basically telling the same story, right? Which is what's going to happen in the future, okay? And so this is a precursor. It's like history repeats itself, and this is a story that repeats itself. And in this instance, God is going to come down and take care of all the mess that we've made, Okay, he did it then, and he'll do it again when Jesus returns. So the, the verse here on 22 that's important to, to read and, and think about. So Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded him. Okay, <clears throat> Think about that for a second. He calls Noah two things. or he, You know two things about Noah. One is he is the only blameless person at the time on earth that God um, has connected with. And two is... Part of the reason why he is the only blameless person is because he does exactly what God commands him. It's challenging, isn't it? We know what God commands us. We know what God wants us to do. But we certainly don't do that. We don't do everything exactly as God has commanded us. <clears throat> There's a lesson to be learned from Noah about how to um, obey God, uh, honor God, respect God, and do what God wants us to do. Okay? If you foreshadow into Matthew, 
you know, my favorite verse, as I talked about all the time, Matthew 22, is talking when Jesus tells everybody what's the most important commandment. They ask him, and he said, love God with all your heart, soul, your mind. Love your neighbor, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That is his greatest commandment. We need to abide by those commandments, just as Noah did exactly as God had commanded him. Okay? Didn't ask him. Didn't say it was a good idea. He commanded him to do this. All right, let's get into the flood. Verse, uh, Genesis 7. <clears throat> Uh, when Noah was ready, the Lord said to Noah, Go into the boat and all of your family, for among all of the people on the earth I can see that you alone are righteous. Take with you seven pairs, male and female, of each animal. I have approved for eating and for sacrifice, and take one pair for each of the others. Also take seven pairs of every kind of bird. There must be a male and a female in each pair to ensure that all life will survive on the earth and after the flood. Seven days from now, I will make it. the rains pour down the earth. And it will rain for 40 days and 40 nights until I have wiped from the earth all the living things I have created. So a couple things to, to note here. Um, one is 40, right? Uh, 40 days and 40 nights. There's two big numbers that are consistent all the way across the Bible. <clears throat> one is seven, right? And one is 40. Uh, seven days from now, I will make the rains pour on the earth. Take seven pairs of each animal. Seven, seven, seven. It's a reference back to Genesis 1, when he's talking about how he built and created the heavens and earth in seven days. Everything is revolved around the seven days, repeating itself all the time. <clears throat> and, so, and the other one's 40, the 40 days and 40 nights. You'll see that repeated all the time uh, in the, throughout the Bible. So now that you have that in your mind, next time you're reading something that references 7 or 40, think about where it comes from. All right? So once again, in verse 5, So Noah did everything as the Lord commanded him. Verse 6, Noah was 600 years old when the flood covered the earth. I have a, I'm, I'm 49 and I have a hard time getting out of bed in the morning sometimes. You can imagine building this ark? And it took him years. Uh, I think it's 125 years, something like that. Uh, they, it took him to build everything and get ready. <clears throat> Noah was 600 when the flood came. When the flood came, excuse me. He went on board, he went on board the boat to escape the flood. He and his wife and all their sons and their wives. With them, uh, were all the various kinds of animals, those approved for eating and for sacrifice, and those that were not, the ones that needed to keep the species alive, along with all the birds and the small animals that scurried along the ground. They entered the boats in pairs, male and female, just as God commanded Noah. After seven days, the floods of the earth came, or I'm sorry, the waters of the flood came and covered the earth. Two things. One, seven days, right? Two is, he talks about... Um, they enter the bear, uh, boat in pairs, male and female. All right, male and female is important. All right, <laughs> verse uh, eleven. When Noah was six hundred years old, uh, on the seventh day of the second month, seventeenth day, excuse me, of the second month, all the underwater, underground waters erupted from the earth. So it wasn't just rain; it was under the earth. Right, <clears throat> all the springs, all the everything that came up, so it just flooded the entire earth, and the rain fell. In mighty torrents from the sky. The rain continued to fall for how many days? 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 13. That very day Noah had gone into the boat with his wife and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives. With them in the boat were pairs of every kind of animal, domestic and wild. It's interesting that they had domestic pets at that point. Domestic and wild, large and small, along with the birds of every kind. Two by two they came into the boat, representing every living thing that breathes. A male and a female of each kind entered, just as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord closed the door behind him. All right, we're going to wrap up in a second, but a couple of comments. <clears throat> One thing is, God continues to protect them. Okay? Because Noah and his family, because Noah is the righteous man, his family is saved. Okay? Two, he tells Noah to build the boat, saving Noah. He's protecting Noah from the flood. And even at the end here, what did the Lord do? Close the door behind them. Noah and his family didn't have to close the door, right? God did it for them. God will help you if you go to him, if you trust him, if you put your hands, and in, 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 I'm sorry, if you put your lives in his hands, okay? Noah trusted God, and his family trusted God. All the way to the point where they got on the, on the boat and God shut the door behind them. Okay? Wherever you're walking in this life, my friends, trust God with it. 
I promise you, God will close those doors that need to be closed. He will open the ones that need to be opened, and he'll always be right with you, okay? That's the, that is the little micro lesson with that, with what you can learn from that one sentence, is God will protect you if you do what he asks you to do, if you trust him. Noah didn't have to figure out how to shut the door. God got it. All right, verse 17. For 40 days, the floodwaters grew deeper, covering the ground and lifting the boat high above the earth. As the waters uh, rose higher and higher above the ground, the boat floated safely on the surface. Finally, the water covered even the highest mountains on the earth, rising more than 22 feet above the highest peaks. All the living creatures on earth died. Birds, domestic animals, wild animals, small animals that scurry along the ground and all the people. How brutal is that? How brutal is that? That the flood came and, and, and killed everything on the earth. It's rough. But life without Christ, life without God is rough. And when you, when you reject him, when you don't do what he asks, and you, and you don't have favor with him, and you don't have a relationship with him, life is tough, even to the extent of this. This is an extreme way of thinking about it, but it is an analogy. All right, verse 22. Everything that breathed and lived on dry land died. God wiped out every living creature on the earth, people, livestock, small animals that scurry along the ground, and the birds in the sky, which is interesting how he keeps referencing the birds. Uh, the storms must have been so bad that they killed birds. Because you would think if it's flooding, the birds can fly above the floods and they can somehow survive. But two things. One is the storms must have been that bad. And two is nowhere for them to land and nowhere for them to eat or nothing for them to eat. All were destroyed. The only people who survived were Noah and those with him on the boat. And the floodwaters covered the earth for 150 days. 150 days. It's a long time. It's a long time. So the lesson learned, and we'll go and we'll continue into uh, eight and nine on Friday. I want to talk about I want to talk about the floodwaters receding, and I want to talk about the new covenant with God. I want to talk about the rainbow. I want to talk about all those things that happened and how they kind of got uh, past this um, worldwide catastrophe. So there's a lot of thoughts here. <clears throat> there's a lot of um, things that you can take away, lessons, but also history. History, right? From a historical perspective, you have to think of what, about what happened. All right? F waters came from underneath and above to flood the entire world. That does a lot. It's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of uh, water. It's a lot of damage to this earth. Um, a lot of things died. People, animals, everything died and were buried in that sediment. <clears throat> to be honest with you, that's probably, and this is somewhat speculation, but it's probably true, that's probably where we got a lot of the fossil fuels and oil and things that we have now are probably from the flood uh, because they were compacted and compressed underneath such intense pressure with all that water. That's a whole other video we can talk about another time, but that's an interesting concept when you kind of think about how, <clears throat> where we were, what happened, physically what happened to the earth. Uh, not just the not just the people, but the structures uh, of the earth and everything that was built before then, and the mountains and the landscape and the buildings and everything else and the people. And it's very interesting. Uh, I think about it a little bit. I, I love the history part of it all and on actually what would happen if that ever did happen. Yeah, it's fascinating. Anyways, that's the that's the first half of the Noah story. We'll hit the rest of it on Friday. So let me. Uh, I'll take a couple of questions. So if you haven't asked your question, uh, hit that question mark on the bottom. And I will uh, hit a couple, and then we'll uh, then we'll get out of here. All right, let's see what questions we have as those kind of keep rolling in a little bit. Um, let's see, what advice can you give a Christian athlete going through difficulty in their career? I would say, uh, whether you're an athlete or whether you you have a day job, if you're having difficulty uh, with a career, if that's if that, make sure that's your ask a question with their career. Okay, <clears throat> you have to kind of ask yourself, what does God want you to do i'm not saying that he doesn't want you to be an athlete maybe he does but are you doing everything you can in your career and in your work to glorify god that's how i look at it right i don't care whether it's a day job i don't care whether you sit in an office i don't know, care if you sell cars i don't care if you are a professional athlete right are you doing that to glorify god in any way or can you glorify god through that career through that vocation the answer is yes the question is are you doing it 
if that makes sense. Uh, if you have a day job and you sit in an office all day long, can you glorify God? Yes, absolutely. Can you share the gospel? Absolutely. Doesn't mean you need to walk through the office and you know, preach the entire time, but there's going to be those opportunities for you to help people along the way and share Jesus Christ along the way. So are you doing that? So you as a career athlete, are you using that uh, platform? Are you using that skill set that you have in order to do what God wants you to do, right? I look at it in terms of um, tithing. And when I mean tithing, I don't necessarily mean monetary tithing. I mean, are you giving your time, treasure, and talents to God? So as your talent of being an athlete, are you using that talent to spread the kingdom? That's the question I, I would ask yourself. That would, that would be my advice to you on what to pray about. Have God, make sure God leads you to what you want to do. So if you're having difficulty in your career, regardless of what it is, ask yourself, are you doing your career, are you using that career to spread the kingdom, to spread the gospel, to glorify God? And if the answer is yes, in any way, even if it's a small way, then maybe that God has you where you need to be at that moment. But if the answer is no, and it's all about you, maybe not. Think about that, brother. All right? All right, let's see what other questions we have. Um, do you repost this on your page? I would like to share with a family member who's struggling. Absolutely, I do. It's, it's saved here shortly when we get in this live. It'll be on the Instagram page under the video section. And as I mentioned at the beginning, as I mentioned all the time, I actually take this recording and we put it on our podcast and we put it on YouTube as well. It takes me about an hour or so to do that uh, afterwards. So uh, feel free to check that out on my Instagram page or on livingchristian.org. And you can do that. But thank you for, I appreciate that. If you'd like to do that, that'd be awesome. Uh, let's see a couple more questions and we'll get out of here. Um, did you say Noah was 600 years old when the flood came? I believe that is what it said. Yes, 600 years. Now you got to think things were different back then, right? Uh, people lived a lot longer. At the first part of what we were reading there in Genesis 6, God talked about maybe, you know, at that point, making people only live to 120. So back then, they were living 900 years. So <clears throat> it wouldn't be 600 years the way you would think of a 600-year-old person at this point. The air was different. Uh, the atmosphere was different pre-flood, which changed a lot of the earth. Um, as I kind of talked about at the end of that, uh, the flood, what it did to the earth to change the atmosphere and change the landscape uh, and changed everything including our longevity on life, uh, including how big vegetation gets and everything, right? So the reality of it is he was 600 years old, but not in the sense of what we would picture a 600-year-old man uh, being. I mean, at this point, if you, if you picture a 100-year-old a, a person, you're like, how can they build a boat? It was a different time back then, and uh, I, I think we had different uh, longevity and lifespans that, back then for sure. So... Um, uh, so if you look at it in the sense of he ended up being 950 years old, something along those lines, I'm sorry, I'm off a little bit, and he was 600, he was two-thirds of the way done. So in our lifespan, he'd be in his 40s or 50s, if that makes sense, uh, kind of uh, from a comparison standpoint. That makes sense. I hope that makes sense. I think it makes sense. All right, one more question, and then we'll get out of here. All right, uh, what Bible verses can help keep Satan at bay, especially... When there's so much bad news around. I, I don't, two things I'll talk about on that. Hold on. Sip of coffee. One is, if you go to the website, I got tons of Bible verse lists. So go through there and read a bunch. Uh, I think there's, I don't know how many are on there, 15, 20. Uh, so for whatever you're dealing with, you can go there and find a nice Bible verse list, a bunch of verses that can help you uh, deal with whatever circumstance you're dealing with. So that aside, promotion aside, I do think if you're having a hard time with... Um, what the world is like today. Um, I think you've got to read the Gospels. I think you've got to read about Jesus. And you've got to understand what he did and what he promised. That makes sense. The, the New Testament is great, specifically the Gospels, and, and are great about keeping perspective about what's real and what's not, because you have to think this world has been sinful since the fall, as we talked about last time, Right? So the world's been a, a tough place to live in for a long, long time. And we think things are bad now. And they are. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to make light of it. But the lifespan, the average lifespan 200 years ago was a lot less than it is now. Things are rough, right? The 1800s were rough for a lot of people. There's still a lot of parts of 
the earth, that, it, that, that living is so challenging. You combine that with um, everything that we're dealing with in my country, right? All the social stuff, the politics, all that garbage with uh, the potential wars that are going on in the world, the famine, the bad news at every corner. I think part of it is the fact that we hear about everything all the time. I think the world has been not great for a long time, okay? How do you deal with that? How do you get out of bed in the morning and try to keep some eternal perspective? Uh, but that's what you have to do, if that makes sense. Um, you've got to think about the long-term life, not what you're dealing with right now. I know it's hard to do that, okay? But if you can, if you can understand and believe the words in red, right, the words of Jesus Christ in, our, in your Bible, and then you kind of keep continue to read the promises and the covenant that he has, the New Testament covenant that he made with us, that if we believe in him and we follow him, then we have eternal life, then this is all temporary. This is all temporary. It's just like what Noah was dealing with, right, before the flood, the world had turned violent. He was talking about how bad everything is. That makes sense. But what did God do? It gave, he gave Noah a way out. He gave Noah a way to live through that violence. Live through the flood, for that matter. And he's given us a way by choosing Jesus. Okay? So if you can keep that focus on hand about... Loving each other, loving your neighbor, loving God with all your heart, soul, your mind, and doing and trying to live the way Jesus did. Not in the miracle sense, but this the way he forgave people and, and, and got people to trust him and led them. That's what we have to do. And with that, we have eternity. With that, we have eternal salvation. And when you have that perspective, everything that goes on in your day to day life and in this world becomes. Not trivial, but a little bit, right? I'm not afraid of what's going on in this world. I don't like it, right? I don't like what's happening. I don't like the potential of wars and stuff. I don't like where our politics is to, are today in my country. I don't like our society right now. I don't like the anger and the hate and the violence that goes on in this world. But at some point, it's going to be over. And it'll be over for me. and it'll be over for you. But Jesus provided us a way to a better life. He provided a way out. He saved us from this flood. That makes sense. So keep that perspective today, and everything will be okay. You can make it through. Lean on God. Put that armor of God on you every day as you go in. Read your Bible every morning. Get ready for that day, and you face it. But you know that God's in control, and Jesus is still king. And with that... It'll be okay. I promise. It'll keep you from getting too uh, disheartened by today's world. <laughs> right? So hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, that. We'll hit uh, the re a couple more chapters in Genesis on Friday. All right, so let's pray today uh, as we end this and, and raise you know, the question about how to get through. One thing that uh, helps you get through this um, world and uh, the turmoil that's happening right now is prayer. So I advise you guys to pray as much as you can. Talk to God all the time. It doesn't have to be formal. It doesn't have to be at church. It doesn't have to be in a group setting. It can just be sitting in your car, sitting on your couch, whatever. Um, go to God. So we'll do it right now real quick and uh, go about our day, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the words that you, that you conveyed to us today in Genesis. There's so many lessons to be learned in your word, Lord. You're telling us and showing us what to do as the world is violent and as a flood is coming in this world figuratively or literally we know that you if we give you our lives and we do as you command us we will be okay we will be saved that's the lesson that we're taking lord we're hearing you we read it and we believe you and we know that you will protect us we will follow and we will do as you ask and we know that you'll protect us and put us in that boat. Dear Heavenly Father, be with the world today. Be with peace. Here in the United States, we have our elections tomorrow. Help us keep calm and level-headed. Help us vote the right way. Help us move forward 
from the turmoil that's going on in this country as well as the world. We need help, Lord. We need your protection, but we need your guidance more than anything. We thank you for the guidance and the strength and the protection you've already given us, but we're asking for more in the future because we need it, Lord. We can't do this alone. Please be with everybody watching this or listening to this right now. Whatever's weighing on their heart, Lord, be with them, comfort them. Give them the strength to get through their personal challenges that they have, their personal floods that they're dealing with right now, Lord. Protect them for that. We trust you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. Love you guys. Thank you for the badges today. Once again, all going to the Christmas fund. And at, uh, once we get kind of closer to Christmas in the middle of December, I'll let you guys know how much we raised. So um, love you guys. Have a great week. Uh, until next time, keep Jesus on your heart, forever on your mind. Talk to you later.